In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, we find the most well-known version of what is typically called the Great Commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like for you to find that passage, if you would, please, in your Bible or on your phone app, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. And when you find that portion of God's Word, I invite you to stand and read along with me silently while I read aloud. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Won't you please be seated? It may surprise you to observe that in Matthew's version of the Great Commission, we see the risen Christ commanding his disciples what they are to go forth and do and a general plan for doing it. They are to make disciples by going and by baptizing and then by teaching to observe all things whatsoever he commanded. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, not complex. But notice what is missing from this version of the Great Commission. There is no mention in these three verses of what is to be taught. If you want to know what is to be communicated and how that truth is to be communicated, you have to go elsewhere. At this time, please turn to Mark's version of the Lord Jesus Christ's Great Commission, which is found in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. This version of the Great Commission makes no mention of making disciples, but is more specific about what message is to be communicated and how it is to be communicated. The gospel is to be preached as well. Specific mention is made of the destiny of individuals being tied to their response to the gospel that is preached to them. It is fitting that the version found in Mark, a gospel thought to be written to benefit a Gentile target audience, would make mention of preaching the gospel to every creature, while Matthew's gospel thought to be written to a Jewish audience makes mention of, quote, all nations, close quote. A comment is needed to clarify this phrase in Matthew's gospel, quote, all nations, comment. And, and in, in the 20th and the 21st centuries, you understand the concept of a nation is quite different than it used to be. With nations all over the world now being populated by different people groups with different ethnic identities. It remains to be proven to many Bible scholars whether the United States is a nation or not, okay? Um, because of the way we came together and all of that. And don't mock, don't mock. I know, know some really, really good Greek guys that I don't even know whether this country is an actual country or not, according to the biblical prescription. But, but the Greek word found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, that, that is translated nations, is the Greek word ethnos, which refers to people united by kinship, culture, and common traditions. Our word ethnic comes directly from this Greek word. So though it is thought these days by English-speaking people that the Lord Jesus Christ was directing his followers to make disciples in every country, which to say every political unit, he was actually referring his followers or directing his followers to make disciples among every ethnic group. Thus, there has always been in the Bible 
a directive to reach people who do not share your ethnic background, who do not look like you, who do not talk like you, do not smell like you, do not eat the food that you like to eat, and frequently don't dress like you. What this means is you cannot claim obedience to the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ by sending missionaries to foreign countries, all the while making no effort to reach those in your same city who grow up speaking a different language than you and eating different food than you are used to eating. We used to have a staff member for a short time at our church and he was an industrial engineer that was trained at the University of Michigan and worked in the Detroit automobile industry until he came to Christ. He was a pastor up in uh, Delano, California, and he pastored a church. And um, one Sunday morning, there was a, a couple came to the congregation and they came again and again and again and again and again, and they wanted to join the church. They were had been members of other churches, and then they met and married each other. And, and so uh, they were a racially mixed couple, and they came forward. And at the next business meeting, the way that church did business was it was brought up to receive them into membership, and someone motioned that that motion be tabled, and they voted unanimously. So the guy told me, he said, oh, I, I guess that's the way they do it here. Never thought anything about it. Well, uh, a couple of weeks later, um, a Hispanic couple came to the church and after several services, they came forward and they wanted to join. And the next time they had a business meeting, they were brought up to the congregation and it was again tabled at the business meeting and the pastor said, oh, what's going on here? And one of them said, pastor, you know, I like Jose. And I like his wife. I work with Jose. He's a good guy. I get along with him great. But that don't mean I want to go to church with him. Whoa. Whoa. Delano is about 75% Hispanic. And this was a lily white and not too bright church in that town. And he, and he said, hold it a second. We're commanded in the Bible to preach the gospel to every creature. And those that respond and come to Christ, we baptize them. They become members. And one of them said, that's a, that's a very good point that you make, Pastor. Could you step out of the auditorium for a while so we can discuss this? This, this is true. They called him and his wife back in a few minutes later, and they said, Pastor, you're absolutely right. We're supposed to preach the gospel to every creature, and when people get saved, we're supposed to baptize them, and they become members. And so we have voted unanimously to abstain from the Great Commission. They didn't want anybody in their church that didn't look like them, talk like them, sound like them. I said, so what did you do, Jay? He said, I resigned on the spot effectively at that moment. He said, I don't want to be a part of any church that is not interested in reaching the entire world, including everyone in our community. Think about that before you scorn that congregation. Some people are actively opposed to the gospel. Some people are passively opposed. They simply do nothing. They do nothing. Thus, what is not so obvious in Matthew's version of the gospel is very obvious in Mark's version of the gospel, where the words Jesus spoke are, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Everyone is to be preached to. Every ethnic group is to be evangelized. A third version of the Great Commission is found in Luke 24. Go ahead and start making your way to that one. Where the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to the two men he encountered on the road to Emmaus following his resurrection earlier. Read along with me, please. Luke 24, verses 45 through 48. Then opened he, that is the Lord Jesus, their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. 
In this version of the Great Commission, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ's desire is that repentance be an integral part of gospel preaching, something which is not so obvious from Matthew's and Mark's gospel. And while the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is specifically noted in this account of the Great Commission, baptism and the training of new disciples is not mentioned even in passing. A fourth version of the Great Commission is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The Lord Jesus Christ uttered these words to his disciples moments before he ascended into heaven to his Father's right hand, where he remains until his second coming. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This version, too, says nothing about baptism and the indoctrination of new converts, but it does clearly show that the entire world was the simultaneous mission field of those disciples. It is very clear from a comparison of the different versions of the Great Commission that are recorded in the New Testament that a certain thing is to be done a certain way to a certain audience and that full compliance with Christ's will requires that all of the versions of the Great Commission be studied and implemented, not actively opposed and not passively ignored. From Matthew's Gospel, we see that the Great Commission is a command to make disciples something that does not show up nearly as strongly in English as it does in the Greek New Testament, by the way. Furthermore, the Great Commission in Matthew shows the particular sequence that is to be employed to make a disciple, as well as emphasizing that every, every ethnic group is to be evangelized. From Mark's gospel, we see an emphasis on preaching on preaching to every creature, on preaching the gospel, on baptism for those who believe, and the destinies of those who believe and those who do not believe. And by the way, in the Bible, to believe is to obey. Don't think you cannot obey and claim that you actually believe. That's not true. Because faith leads to faithfulness. Faithfulness is an integral part of faith. From Luke's gospel, we see that repentance is an integral part of genuine evangelistic preaching, something rarely emphasized these days. And in the other New Testament book that Luke wrote, the book of Acts, we observe what we have seen in other gospel accounts of the Great Commission, that all of mankind is the mission field and that the Lord Jesus Christ's directive is to take the good news to everyone. My text for this morning is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. And I'd like you to, I invite you to stand once again as we read those three verses again. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20, for emphasis. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Won't you please be seated? Thank you. The Lord Jesus Christ trained his men with repetition. Again and again and again, he would teach a truth, a little variation here, a little variation there, a little variation here, a little variation there, but all the same truth again and again. First this way, then that way, and then another way, over and over and over again, until those men thoroughly understood not only the truth, but also the implications of that truth. Methinks pastors, including me, do a disservice to church members by teaching too much new truth and not spending enough time inculcating old truths into people until it becomes a part of their lives, your lives, until it is absorbed deep into the recesses of their minds, your minds, until it becomes a part of their view of the world around them, your view of the world around you. The Lord Jesus Christ was not guilty of that error. 
whether it be the Great Commission or some other truth, the Savior's approach was based upon his understanding that precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. But the Great Commission was given 2,000 years ago to a small group of believers who were members of the church Jesus founded, who lived 8,500 miles from here, what does it really have to do with you? And what does it really have to do with me? And with some people, their response, the way they live their lives, their infrequent church attendance, they're never witnessing to anyone, their terror of inviting someone to church indicates that they don't think it has anything to do with them. And that's sad because it does. And that is why the title of my message this morning is Our Great Commission. Our Great Commission. By the time I've concluded, I want you to buy into the Great Commission as not only the Great Commission given by our Lord Jesus Christ, but also the Great Commission as given to you and me. Consider the title of this message as the focus of three ideas that I want you to consider. The first part of our Great Commission is that it is ours. It is possible that something can at one and the same time be possessed by one and also by another. There's absolutely nothing wrong with me reckoning that the house I live in is mine, while at the same time my wife and my daughter can also think of it as theirs. Thus, while we own up to the fact that the Great Commission is the Lord Jesus Christ's, in that he authored it, he verbalized it, he issued it, it is also ours in that we are the intended recipients of Christ's directive. But at this point, there is a question raised in the minds of some. How can the Great Commission be mine when it was issued so long ago to some men so far away? Please look carefully to the last half of Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. For the answer to that curious question, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. How very comforting were these words from the risen Savior to his disciples. What profound assurance they derived from this one who had conquered death, that he would be with them as they faced persecution, and yes, even death. He would be with them. But do not fail to notice that the Savior's words of comfort were not directed only to the men who faced him on that occasion. Even unto the end of the world reveals that this promise of comfort and consolation was guaranteed to Christ's followers long after those men were dead and buried. The word translated world in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, is the Greek word ionos, which, is, which has so broad a range of meanings that it can mean the world as a geographical region. It can refer to a long period of time without reference to beginning or end. It can even refer to an age or to an era of history. In this context, the word translated world clearly refers to an era of human history throughout this era in which we live. So you see, what the Lord Jesus Christ said to those men so long ago and so far away is applicable to you and to me. We who are here today in Calvary Road Baptist Church, it's as applicable to us as it was to them. This process of making disciples who will then make disciples was intended by our Lord Jesus Christ to be an age-long process ending only with the rapture of all believers. So you can take the Great Commission as being just as much yours as it was John's. It's just as much yours as it was Peter's. It's just as much yours as it was Matthew's. It's just as much yours as it was Andrew's. 
and so on. But it is, or I should say, turning it into a question, but is it legitimate to own the Great Commission as our commission? Is that, is that legitimate? Is, is that appropriate? Consider the parallel of the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, verse 1, the Apostle Paul identifies the gospel as the gospel of God. God's gospel. In Romans chapter 1, verse 9, Paul identifies the gospel as the gospel of his son, as essentially Christ's gospel. But in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, he strongly asserts that the, that the gospel is my gospel, Paul's gospel. And he does it again in Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Finally, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 3, he refers to the gospel as the possession of both himself and his co-laborers when he writes, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I submit to you that if Paul was able to own the gospel as his by virtue of the fact that he embraced it, by virtue of the fact that he believed it, and by virtue of the fact that he preached it, the same thing should be true of you and should be true of me insofar as the Great Commission is concerned. Do you embrace the great commission of my Lord Jesus Christ? Yes or no? We have members who most certainly do, and we have members who obviously do not. That breaks my heart. Do you agree with the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you agree with it? We have members who claim that they do, and we have members who seem more to show that they do not. Are, are you given over to obeying the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ? Then you and I and the rest of us here in this church who have believed the gospel and who have been baptized and are members in good standing and who are being taught to observe all things whatsoever Christ has commanded, we can own the Great Commission as ours just as surely as the apostles of Jesus Christ did. Amen? Additionally, our Great Commission truly is great. Do we not have a great God? <laughs> is not our Lord and Savior a great Lord and a great Savior? Is, he, is, is His not a great salvation? The writer of Hebrews asks, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So our God is great. Our Savior is great. And our salvation is great. What about the gospel? Would the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, should that not be considered a great gospel? How can our commission not be a great commission? A great salvation conceived in the throne room of heaven by our great God, secured for sinners at great cost by the great sacrifice of our great Savior. There is no other way to describe our commission. It is great. It is a great strategy for taking the great gospel to the expanse of mankind so that sinners might be partakers of a great salvation whereby they might come to the great Savior and be reconciled to the great God Almighty. There's nothing that's not great about any of that. And yet some people ask like it's something to be ashamed of. They live their lives as though it's something to not be mentioned to anyone. <coughs> Our great commission is great because it is a great challenge for a great cause. It is a great enterprise for a people made great by the grace of God. And the results are also great, are they not? There is great grace for those who respond that they might be reconciled to God and someday enjoy the great delight of heavenly bliss. And there is great tragedy and heartache for those great fools who dallied and dithered and who waited and wasted time. 
when death suddenly comes upon them. Yes, everything about our Great Commission is great. And nothing about our Great Commission is not great. It has been well named. And finally, our Great Commission is truly a commission to get a handle on what communion in or what on what commission is. <laughs> commission. To get a handle on what a commission is, consider the United States military. Certainly nothing like what it used to be, but still resembles enough of a military to withstand some comparisons. Among the ranks of enlisted personnel in the military, there are those of superior rank that are called non-commissioned officers. There are different grades of corporal and different grades of sergeant or their equivalent in the Navy. But all corporals and all sergeants in the United States military are non-commissioned officers, not to mention specialists, specs four, spec fives, I don't even want to talk about them. Of higher rank in the United States military are commissioned officers. To illustrate the distinction between the two, between non-commissioned and commissioned officers, it is required, you may not have known this, but it is required that a non-commissioned officer actually be discharged from active duty so that he, in effect, becomes a civilian before he can receive a commission as an officer. Did you know that? So you have, let's say you have some... Uh, some sergeant in the Marine Corps, and they want to make a Mustang commissioned officer out of him, in order for that to happen before his commissioning, he has to resign as, a, as an enlisted member of the United States Marine Corps before they can then grant to a civilian the status as a commissioned officer in the United States Marine Corps. And by the way, once he's an officer in the Marine Corps, he's no longer a Marine. The Marines are those who are enlisted, technically, technically. Thus, when an army sergeant is promoted to second lieutenant, except in the case of a temporary battlefield commission, he is first discharged from the army as a non-commissioned officer, and he has to sign all the proper discharge papers. And then he receives a commission in the officer corps of the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marine Corps. Why are our officers thus specifically commissioned while our enlisted personnel are not commissioned. And we go so far as to specify they are non-commissioned. Because a commission in the United States Armed Forces is actually a presidential authorization to act on behalf of the United States government, enabling the commissioned officer to, assert, to, to assume certain duties, obligations, and responsibilities that that commissioned officer has to discharge certain obligations and assigning both responsibility to him and accountability to him in a manner that is not the case with enlisted personnel. So take note of the four versions of the Great Commission that we have looked at this morning. Does our Great Commission authorize us to act? Well, Jesus did say all power or authority is given unto me, did he not? He said that. He was thus stating that he had the authority to commission as the president of the United States had been granted authority by Congress to commission officers. So the Lord Jesus Christ has authority to commission. Think about it, church member. You have been commissioned by the highest authority in existence anywhere in the universe. The Lord Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, to act on his behalf to discharge assigned duties, to fulfill assigned responsibilities, and you will be held accountable. Should anyone's spouse be able to stop them from discharging the duties of their commission? How about your boss? Should he be able to stop you? How about your head coach? Should he be able to stop you? How about your school? Should it be able to stop you? I don't think so. But understand that this great commission of ours is not assigned to individuals like commissions in the Army or Navy are, 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 
are assigned. Our Great Commission is delegated to our church, to Calvary Road Baptist Church. You say, how do you know that? Well, look back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. I'll show you. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Only churches have the authority to baptize. So for our great commission to be invested with the authority to make disciples by going and then by baptizing, it must be a commission that invests churches with authority, not individuals. Thus, our great commission is not my great commission. Neither is our great commission your great commission. It truly is our great commission, just as certainly as those of us who are church members can say that Calvary Road Baptist Church is our church. You can say it's our church as soon as you become a member. Yes, it is Christ's church. Yes, he is the church's head. But for those of us who are members here, this is our church invested with authority by the Lord Jesus Christ, making it our great commission. Next week is our very important friend day. It is not my friend day. Neither is it your friend day. It is our Friend Day, an especially constructed event we will employ to secure commitments from unbelieving friends and acquaintances as a means of doing what our Lord Jesus Christ has commanded us to do. Before my call to the ministry, I was an extremely committed church member. I wanted my life to count for something for the cause of Christ. I was a giver. I was a goer. I was a prayer. I was available. So I hope that I was not the pastor, if, that if I was not the pastor of this church, I, I would still be a faithful and committed church member. I was before I became a pastor. I expect to be so after I am no longer a pastor. The question you might want to ask is, what leads to such commitment? What leads to such a willingness as some of our church members exhibit? Is it their love for God and their desire to exalt Christ? In part, perhaps, though there are many who profess Christ who count for little along the way. I am persuaded that one factor that leads to commitment, you know, where your word is your bond, you say you're going to be there and you're going to be there and you say you'll be on time and you're actually on time. And you don't have to spend your entire life apologizing to everybody about the fact that you never do what you say you're going to do. I am persuaded that one factor that leads to commitment, an ingredient that results in effectiveness in the Christian life, comes from buying into the Great Commission and owning it as ours. This individualism nonsense in the United States has gone too far. It's just gone too far. It, and this occurs, this buying in occurs when one church member comes to the realization that the church he or she belongs to is my church <clears throat> and, and realizes that the great commission that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to his disciples as representatives of churches they, they led at, at, is our great commission. This is our great commission. We ought to be, don't you think, we ought to be immersed in something far bigger than us as individuals. Even more than marriage. There's something to be committed to that's more than marriage. We ought to be swallowed up by the cause of Christ. And the practical and gut level result of being swallowed up by the cause of Christ is seen by a person's involvement in his or her local church as that local church works to fulfill the Great Commission. There's something bigger than us. Some guys think it's family. No. Others think it's country. No. It's the gospel. It's the Great Commission. What happens when that Christian, when that church member, sees the Great Commission of his Lord Jesus Christ as our Great Commission, a commission delegated to him and the others in the church that he is a member of? 
then you begin to serve God more effectively. Then you're caught up in the realization that you are who God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do. Now, is it easy? No. Nothing worthwhile is ever easy. Are there heartaches and setbacks and disappointments? Certainly. Can it become frustrating? Of course. <laughs> But there is nothing this side of eternity that matches the satisfaction of knowing who you are, knowing what you are, and doing what God created you to do. My desire is that you will get in harness and that you will embrace as your personal marching orders as a member of this church our great commission. You have one week to do what you can to get lost people under the sound of the gospel. You got a week. For you or for those you invite, understand there may never be another opportunity. There may never be another opportunity. So, carpe diem, seize the day. Amen? Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. I pray that you might work in the lives of God's people to do right. And those that have no interest in doing right, no discernible level of commitment, I pray that you might bring to their attention the very real possibility that they may not be born again. Because when you give to a sinner a new nature, a new heart, they have new values, they have a new perspective, they have a new goal in life rather than self-satisfaction and self-fulfillment. You then become all important and your will becomes urgent for us. So bless in that way and we will thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.